Good morning. Good morning to those of you who are here and those of, us, of you who are joining us online this morning as well. It's good to be with you this morning. Uh, today we um, continue a series that we started last week, an introduction or a reintroduction to Jesus, uh, using Jesus' own words to describe who he is. We're looking at the Gospel of John and looking at six of the statements, the what we call I am statements, where Jesus describes himself in his own words. Things like, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the vine. I am the good shepherd. Last week, Steve talked about, I am the bread of life and challenged us in our understanding that God, that Jesus is our sustenance. And this morning we continue with the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John, where Jesus says, I am the gate. Now, I want to talk about the 10th chapter, but before we talk about the 10th chapter, we kind of have to talk about the 9th chapter, because what Jesus says is in response to, hap to what happens in chapter 9. And going straight to chapter 10 would be kind of like listening to the commentary of the news, without actually hearing the account of what happened. And so we're going to go back to chapter 9 um, and learn about what sets this, this statement up. Um, but before we do, let me just pause for a moment and invite you to pray for me in sharing this message with you, and I'll pray for you uh, in receiving it, that God will speak a word into your life today. Let's pray. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So here's the news. Here's the actual account of what happened and the context for Jesus saying, I am the gate. There's a man, and he's been born blind. And in those times, that meant that everyone thought that he was a sinner. Or, if not him, then his parents were sinners. Because anyone with any kind of disease or disability was understood to be that way because they had sinned. And then Jesus encounters him. And Jesus heals him. And, oh, by the way, Jesus heals him on the Sabbath when no work of any kind, including healing, was to be done. It was against the religious law to heal on the Sabbath. You may remember that story. Jesus spits on the ground and he makes mud and he tells the blind man to put the mud on his eyes and then to go and wash. And when he washes the mud... He miraculously can see. You know, sometimes we can miraculously see again when finally the mud is cleared from our eyes. When the Pharisees, the religious leaders, heard that this man had, had been healed, they were up in arms. They interrogate the uh, formerly blind man, the man who was healed. Ha how were you healed? And, and what do you say about the one who healed you? And then they interrogate his parents. Is this your son? Was he born blind? And how was he healed? And they say, well, well you could just go ask him because he's the one who was healed. And then they go back to the formerly blind man and they say, the man who healed you was a sinner. How did he heal you? And the blind man says, I, I already told you, and you didn't listen. True to form, the religious leaders want to be the gatekeepers. They want to decide who is a sinner and who is not. In their eyes, Jesus is a sinner as is the man who he healed on the Sabbath. Finally, they press the blind man enough 
until exasperated he says Jesus healed me and Jesus is a man of God and then the Pharisees say, the Pharisees say how dare you think that you could tell us anything and they expel him from the synagogue they cast him out of the community of faith then Jesus finds him you know Jesus has a habit of finding those who are cast out of the church I, I mean the synagogue Jesus picks up the pieces and offers them healing and salvation and an invitation to believe in him the man who is healed says Lord I believe and then he worships Jesus Now that we've got the facts, the account of what happened, let's turn to chapter 10 and see what Jesus has to say in response to the healing and in response to the gatekeeping of the religious leaders. The 10th chapter of, of the Gospel of John. Very truly I tell you, Anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in another way is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he's brought them out, when he's brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the word of God for the people of God and God's people say, thanks be to God. So in this passage, there are a lot of uh, sheep and shepherd and gate and gatekeeper images. And, and first of all, I want to encourage you not to get distracted by trying to pigeonhole every metaphor. Metaphors can be messy, and, and they just don't always neatly line up, especially in Scripture. What we do know is that this Scripture is all about sheep herding. And while that may have been a common image um, for the original hearers of what Jesus was saying, uh, it may not be quite so familiar for us today. So, so let me just give you a little bit of a refresher about sheep herding in the day of Jesus. First of all, each shepherd had, its own, had his own flock to care for. And each shepherd would know his own sheep and might even be able to call them by name. Oh, there's Spot. And oh, that's Curly. And, and there's Fluffy over there. And the sheep would also know the shepherd. They would recognize the, the voice and the particular calling of their own shepherd. Now at night, the shepherd would lead the sheep into the sheepfold. Um, it was a large cordoned off area with a wall around it. It might, it might be two walls coming out of the edge of, uh, of a hillside, or it might be two walls um, adjacent to a house so that one of the walls could, could be the house. And those walls would have rocks like this on the top of it, um, sharper rocks or sometimes branches with thorns to keep out the thieves and the bandits. Um, and then each wall, uh, each uh, sheep pen, sheepfold, 
would have an opening, an opening that might have a gate, uh, might even have a gate that could be, um, could be locked, but it might just have a, a gate that was open, a, a, an opening um, without a gate, wide enough for the sheep to be able to travel through. So the shepherd would take the sheep out into the field in the day and lead them into the protection of the sheepfold, the walled pen, at night. And the shepherd would stay with them, protecting them from the sheep rustlers and, and the bandits and, and even the wolves who would, might try to sneak in at night and attack. Sometimes that gate would be closed and locked. But other times, if there wasn't a gate, the shepherd would actually lie down in the opening of the gate to be a physical barrier, knowing that no one could enter into the sheepfold and do any harm without going through him. Now, this kind of reminds me of um, when I was a youth director, and one of the standard rules for youth retreats and mission trips, some of you guys may know this, um, we would often stay in churches or classrooms, I mean, or schools in classrooms and sleep on the floor. And there would be a girl's room, pink, and there would be a boy's room, blue. And the standard rule was no, no purpling, no purpling, no purpling. And, of course, they would never challenge that, but just in case... We might have a counselor sleeping in the hallway between the pink room and the blue room just to ensure that there's no purpling, right? Well, the shepherd would lay down in that opening and sleep, and he would make himself the gate so that no bandits or wolves could come in and attack or harm the sheep at night. And then the next morning, the shepherd would rise from the gate, and the sheep would be brought out to find green pastures and still waters. Jesus says, I am the gate. And, and you know, somehow in the church, those of us in the church seem to think that we get to be the gate keepers. We get to decide who's in and who's out. We get to tell Jesus when to open that gate or not. We have a long history, actually, of appointing ourselves as the gatekeepers, so much so that there's actually a practice called fencing the table. That would be this table. Fencing the table. It was a practice of, of actually putting up a fence to keep in those who could receive and were worthy to receive communion and to keep out those who were not. You know, we, we, we still have this altar rail around, and I had always heard that it was to keep the animals that might be wandering around out of um, this area, the chancel area, the area of the altar. Um, but maybe it's left over from the fencing of the altar, I don't know, or the fencing of the table. In the 16th century, this practice was used, this practice of fencing the table was used by Calvin and the reformers to fence out the libertines. In the 20th century, it was used by the confessing church in Germany to fence out the Nazi officers. I, I might like that gatekeeping practice. In the 18th and 19th centuries, we might have done that in a different way um, as we uh, barred slaves from coming in the main entrance, but they had to come in another entrance, and they had to sit in the slave balcony. That was a way of, of fencing. There's a church in St. Augustine, an Episcopal church, and <clears throat> they have um, just begun pointing out to people that they had two areas where slaves were, uh, were fenced out in their sanctuary. It wasn't all of the balcony, but it was actually two small chambers that were on either side of the organ where there was no ventilation and no opening and a burlap um, a piece of fabric covering the front so that no one had to see them. And this Episcopal church 
has now started um, highlighting that as a way to confront their history. I also know of a United Methodist Church in Hillsboro, Florida. One of my clergy colleagues served there um, years ago. And in the 1980s, in the 1980s, when the ushers would notice a family of color approaching the steps, they would go and meet them and turn them aside and let them know that they weren't welcome in the early 1980s. And, and then in one of the previous settings where I served, I had a couple come in and talk to me and tell me that they were concerned about who was serving communion, that those serving communion might not be worthy. And they wanted me, me, to be the judge and jury and decide who was worthy to serve and who was not. Of course, they wanted to tell me who was worthy and who was not. We, the church, have a long history of assuming that we are the gatekeepers and even being so bold as to think that we can start measuring the gate or reinforcing the gate or, most egregious, telling Jesus the gate who can enter and who cannot. Jesus said, I am the gate. Remember, he was speaking to the religious leaders who were claiming the position of gatekeeper, who were thinking uh, that they got to be the gatekeepers. Who are we to think that we can be the gatekeepers? What kind of arrogance is that? Jesus said, I am the gate. And here's the funny thing about this story. When the religious leaders have proclaimed that this man who was healed is a sinner and healed by a sinner and done on the Sabbath, what do they do with him? They cast him out. They cast him out. But you know what? According to Jesus, it may not be a bad thing to be cast out. Let me, let me explain. Listen to verse 4 again. When he the shepherd, has brought out all his own, the sheep. He goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. He brought out all the sheep. Now, that's the same Greek word that is used when the Pharisees cast out the healed man. It's said a little more gently here. I'm not sure why it's translated so gently here. But you get the gist. Jesus also casts out the sheep. In this parable, it's not that Jesus is deciding who to let in and who to keep out, but that Jesus is the gate for the sheep, both to come in for protection and safety and also to bring them out, to cast them out to push them out into the green grasses and the wide open spaces. Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. As a sheep, I'm pretty sure that I want to stay in the safety and security of the sheep pen. I feel protected within those walls. I feel comfortable with the status quo, but just as Jesus has led me into the security of his grace, he also gives me a not so gentle shove out so I won't grow stagnant and want to be sequestered. Think about it. Jesus as the gate, doesn't want us to stay walled up and sequestered in our pens. Is it that or is that God so loves the world that the gate swings wide open, both to save us and to give us abundant life? 
In Romans 5, 1 and 2, Paul writes, We throw open our doors to God and discover at that same moment that he has already thrown open the door to us. We find ourselves standing where we'd always hoped we might stand, out in the wide open places of God's grace and glory. You know, for the last several months, we've been pinned up in our homes. We've been sequestered in safety. And we've been grateful for, for the security and the protection in our homes. The protection of Christ in our lives. But for many of us, the dawn is coming the morning is coming, and, and we're now moving out through the gate. We're venturing out into those wide open spaces. As a church, too, we are being gently shoved into new spaces with scenery that we've, we've not explored before. We may not be, be able to envision it, what it looks like or where it will lead, but we are shoved out into those wide open spaces. You know, Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved. He leads us in and restores our soul. He, he picks up the pieces of our lives and puts us back together again. And then he shoves us out into green pastures and beside still waters. Jesus has come saying, I am the gate. He has come to offer us life and to offer it abundantly. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning asking you to save us. Save us with your grace as we enter your safety and protection. Save us from our sin and from ourselves as we seek to be gatekeepers of your salvation. when we are fearful of leaving the security of our sequestered lives, push us out into the wide open spaces of a new day. May we follow your lead into the abundant life that awaits us in life with you. In the name of Jesus Christ, who is our gate, we pray. Amen.